Hi, my name is uh, Matt Bell. I'm a professor here in the English department. I'm very happy to be chairing this panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers and let them speak in the order they are on the program. And then we're happy to facilitate questions and answer that first. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Uh, and we'll just uh, go down the line. Jay Speaks <coughs> is Dine from the Navajo Nation. He is an MFA candidate at the Institute of American Indian Arts Low Res MFA program. He's a Pushcart nominee, and his poetry has appeared both online and in print. He is the founding editor of Cloud Throat, an online journal that publishes native, indigenous, First Nations writing and art. He currently resides in the Navajo Nation, where he tutors at Dine College, and organizes a poetry salon and reading series called Pollen Tongue. He also founded Res Condom Tour that increases access to contraception for DNA youth and also supports the current Miss Navajo Nation 2017 to 2018 in her projects around the reservation, especially in er areas of college success, writing, and physical health. Raquel Gutierrez is a poet, performer, and ess essayist pursuing her MFA degree in poetry and nonfiction at the University of Arizona. Born and raised in Los Angeles, she writes about Brown ontology, art, music, space, and institutionality, and publishes chapbooks by queers of color with the tiny press, Econo Textual Objects, established in 2014. Her work has found homes in Fence, uh, Zocalo Public Square, ASAP Journal, The Portland Review, Los Angeles Weekly, and Entropy. Gutierrez was awarded a Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation's Arts Writers Grant this year to support a short form essay series about contemporary artistic practices in Los Angeles, excuse me, focusing on artists who are dealing with poverty, addiction, homophobia, misogyny, the carceral state, and prison industrial complexes. Gabriel Dozal is an MFA candidate in poetry at the University of Arizona. He is from El Paso, Texas, and writes about life in the borderlands. Uh, Jay, would you like to start us off? Yeah, thank you, Jay. Hello, everybody. Yate, Bene, Ahalana, Shake, Shane, Doshika, Asin, Go Yate, Ash, Matthew, Jake, Skeets, and Inche, Sanajin, and Schle, Tuba, and Bush's Chin, Tkach, and Dashate, Do, Turikoj, and Dashanella, Nle, not the Joshua, Shat the Archigo, Bahale, Boye, Dajanitle, Hamasane, Hadan, Nagahi, Dan, Nijavahle. Hello everybody, my name is Matthew Jake Skeets, though I prefer to go by Jake, um, and I'm an MFA candidate in poetry from IAIA, and the Lorez MFA program in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm also, um, as mentioned, a professional writing tutor at Danette College, which is the Navajo Nation's uh, tribal college um, up in northern Arizona in Winter Rock. Mm. Um, I also am an adjunct at Navajo Technical University as well. Um, my clans are Black Street Wood, born for Water's Edge. My maternal grandparents, uh, well, grandfathers are red running into water. My paternal grandfathers are the Salt People clan. Um, and my, and what I said in Navajo was actually my introduction. And in my introduction are sort of like key takeaways that, that go towards my presentation on indigenous eco-poetics. So I'll just explain that a little bit. Um, it's sort of like Navajo culture, it's, it's, it's also proper to say where your grandmother is from, only because uh, there are certain relationships that are encoded into Navajo children from birth, uh, much like genetics, and that's my relationship to Bread Springs, New Mexico, where my grandmother is from. So even though I was raised a li little bit to the south of it, in Vanduagen, New Mexico, which both of those communities are a little south of Gallup, New Mexico on the Route 66 in New Mexico. Um, I still say I'm from Red Springs, only because that's where my grandmother is from. And that's where most of my grandmothers, right, so my grandmother's mother's mother, dating generations have been from. Um, so that's what I say there. Um, and so I can definitely sort of date my date generations back to the Navajo Long Walk from all my ancestors within a 50 mile radius surrounding Red Springs. So I have a very intimate and personal relationship to that land. And so when I say my introduction is my connection to that particular landscape, only because I want to bring that out into the world and share that with people that I'm from a particular place where, where my grandmothers have always been, um, dating back since the removal of uh, sort of Navajo people. And so in Navajo tradition as well, generally when a child is born, the afterbirth is buried in a family's particular homestead um, 
So my afterbirth is buried in Bread Springs, Mexico, which again, is also why I say I'm from Bread Springs, even though I'm technically not. Um, and also during a young girl's puberty ceremony, she bakes a cake in, also in her homestead as a, again, as a connection to that particular homeland and that land that she's walking on. And so all these are particular sort of concepts I wanna get into when I'm talking about indigenous eco-poetics and this relationship with land, which is very intense, intimate, um, and pretty much overarching. Um, and so uh, when I'm talking about indigenous eco-poetics, I'm particularly talking about the areas of sovereignty and decolonization in regards to native nations, uh, particularly um, in the question that Scott Lyons asks, what do Indians want from writing, right? Um, so Scott Lyons argues that people want sovereignty as the inherent right and ability of peoples to determine their own communicative needs and, de and, and deserves in the pursuit of self-determination. Um, so he talks about rhetorical sovereignty and this idea of native nations being able to pursue their own indigenous thought and criticisms, sort of coming up with their own ideas, basically. Um, and indigenous writing and writing, particularly, is as an avenue towards that. And so, in my particular essay in my presentation, um, it generally is sort of like my craft essay, and my thesis essay for my master's program right now. I had to tailor it a little bit to talk a little bit more about social justice, only because I couldn't really talk about that in my MFA. Um, only because they said, you know, you're supposed to talk about craft only, leave the social justice out. Um, so I had to sort of bring it back in. And so first I just want to go over some of the vocabulary I'm going to be using. So indigenous, by that what I mean is uh, native First Nations, Aboriginal, or indigenous people of the Americas particularly. Um, Eco-poetics is generally a new field of poetic study. Um, some famous poets include Jonathan Skinner and Forrest Gander um, about this whole avenue of eco-poetics, so poetry focusing on environment, ecology. Um, and so when I bridge indigenous eco-poetics together, I'm talking about a critical poetics by Native nations that interrogates ecology, environment, land, sovereignty, and self-determination. Um, and so in order to define e indigenous eco-poetics, I go over uh, some concepts by three native poets, Sherwin Bitsui, Kimberly Blazer, Orlando White, and then sort of at the end, I'm gonna try and bridge it into social justice and what, um, and try to answer the question as well, what do Indians want from writing? And so, in the first concept by Sherwin Bitsui, he delivered a lecture at IAI called Where the Field Poem Ends, The Field Poem Begins, where he talks about poetic crafts, relationship with land and landscape. So I sort of um, shortened that to a concept called the field poem, um, in which uh, poetic craft interacts with the land. And so, for example, this is uh, the beginning poem in Shoin Bitsui's uh, collection, Flood Song. So as you can see, the word twa, 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 that's sort of right smack dab in the middle of the page in the beginning of this collection. And so twa is the Navajo word for water, which places the reader in this physicality, right? So they can hear water dripping somewhere. Um, and so there's a physical relationship already set up in the beginning of this collection. And so Bitsui talks about writing this poem, coming up with this poem in his lecture uh, of the field poem. And then he also goes over uh, Alison Hedgecoat's uh, collection, Blood Run, uh, which is a collection of persona poems by perspective of plants, hills, that surround uh, the native Mound City Blood Run, uh, which is now called the Good Earth State Park in South Dakota. Um, and so according to Chadwick Allen, Blood Run's poetic prosody is mathematically encoded to match the indigenous built site. So what that means is um, the poems themselves uh, are matched to the landscape themselves. So Sherwin Bitsui Bitsu, talks about visiting Good Earth State Park with Hedgeco, and Hedgeco actually read the collection out loud to him as they were walking around the mounds and the mound city. So Sherwin Bitsui was able to see how the poems themselves are able to take shape with the landscape as they were going through. So again, it's this physicality that's presented, and they're able to walk through the poems um, in Blood Run. 
And so, uh, again, the field poem uses landscape as a poetic craft, um, which would go towards this idea of an ego poetics, right? So this idea of having a critical poetics that's um, firmly um, sort of standing ground in the landscape. Which brings me on over to Kimberly Blazer's what she calls wordscape. Uh, wordscape, you know, can be mean a different things today. I think there's an app called Wordscape, where it's like a puzzle. Um, but, um, but what Blazer's talking about in wordscape is the physical landscape that's constructed by any given English written word. Um, so she talks about revising for energy to poets who want to you know, spruce up their poems. She wants to look at structurally how a word is um, presented on the page and how that enacts some sort of physicality or landscape. Um, so for this, I think about Lady the Long Soldier's Whereas, right? So it's a very acclaimed collection. Um, the beginning poem again, now make room in the mouth for grasses, 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 right? So she has grasses three times and she sort of combines them together to have this type of physicality in this landscape of the plains where she's talking about, and that, that sort of is driven throughout her collection. Um, so that's what I mean by wordscape, is this idea of creating a landscape with a particular word, which again goes back to this relationship that poems have with landscape. Um, and so this brings me to Orlando White's one word poem. And so at the Net College, uh, the Orlando White is faculty there. He teaches poetry. He also teaches the English 101 and 102 classes. So particularly in his English 101 classes, he teaches students how to write a one-word poem in a composition class, right? So essays, you know, comp comprehension and stuff like that. He also teaches one-word poems as a way to bridge poetry, um, the the net pedagogy of lurging, which I'll which I'll touch on later, to composition study and teaching Navajo students particularly how to write, particularly how to write academically. Um, and so this is this is his profile picture. Um, it's an amber bear by one of his students named Quintara Yazi. Um, and Quintara and Orlando both gave me permission to use this image. Um, it's an ambergram that you can also flip upside down and it's the same word, right? Um, and this is sort of like the so the Navajo word for hello or good is yate, which I said in the beginning. Um, but generally, if you're not from the Navajo Nation, you kind of had a hard time saying it. So people say like ya yate or yite or something like that. So this is what Quintero is playing with, and she's able to again make language material, make language physical, so that she's able to physically up you know turn her paper upside down, and it's still the same word. So this is the idea of again of being able to manipulate language to create some type of physicality, to conjure up a landscape. Um, and so that's what Orlando White does in his English 101 classes. And so this sort of bring, sort of combines all together in the talk about social justice and what, Indi what do Indians want from writing, what do Native nations and communities want from writing, um, particularly a material and physical language that they can manipulate. Um, and so, this brings me back on over to Danette College. Um, so at Danette College, it's the first tribally controlled college in the nation. It's right, it's, this year's its 50th anniversary. And they have a unique sort of educational philosophy that's grounded in a Navajo concept called um, So what that means is kind of like harmony and balance um, and this reciprocal relationship and uh, sort of revolutionary, and re by revolutionary I mean like the turning of things um, relationship to education. And so all teachers have to have this concept ingrained in their syllabus. Um, and so when, hopefully I'm gonna be teaching there here soon, so I'm gonna have to sort of tailor my syllabus to uh, sort of embrace this concept. And so Orlando White does it through his one word poems and this idea of the Navajo language being physical, being able to turn it around, being able to manipulate it. Another faculty member named Velma Hell um, talks about the physicality of language um, in a very sort of direct way. Um, she, of course, introduces first students to sort of like the militarization of the English language against Native people, right? How English was used 
as a tactic of war to remove uh, Native people from their lands, particularly in treaties, right? Being able to, Native nations not being able to interpret what English language or what written English language was, um, and also giving them a written language as well. Um, that whole idea of uh, language used as a tactic and aggression of aggression, I mean. Um, and so, this is the net pedagogy of learning that Velma Hell sort of introduces in her work. Um, so first she goes over how English language was used to remove native peoples, and then she goes into how English language can be used as a tactic of native students particularly when learning composition. And so she calls this, uh, you know, well, it's called the circadian rhythms in humans. Um, so generally at 7.30 a.m. is when your sharpest blood pressure rises. Um, that's also the same time that Navajo people are supposed to wake up in the morning so that they're able to greet uh, sort of the holy deities, able to call blessings upon themselves, and then she's able to teach this particular um, process in combination with the uh, with uh, with uh, the uh, the time of day that Navajos are supposed to be doing stuff based on tradition, and so she goes through that first, and then she moves on over into the Navajoistic approach. Uh, which is again, it's this circle. It follows that same notion of the circadian rhythms. Um, so as you can see, there's different aspects of it, of um, basically, and then Sa'ah case is thinking, Nahata is planning, Ina is life, and Tsiasin is uh, sort of like it's harmony. So she goes through this process with students as a way of approaching then the writing process. So this is what she came up with, right? So pre-writing is the Nisaha case. Nahata planning is the outline format generally that Navajo students go through. Or I guess all English students go through, right? So learning how to outline their papers. And then Ina, that <coughs> section is the writing of the drafts. So being able to actually start writing. And then Siha Sen is self-awareness, proofreading, peer evaluation, eventually publishing if they want to go that route. Um, so she follows this format as a way to go through English composition and composition studies in her particular classrooms. And so, when I talk about um, Native nations and what they want particularly from social justice, um, is this whole idea again, right, of it reintroducing the English language, but, from, but on the terms of Native nations particularly. Um, and so, <clears throat> when, when we talk about this physical landscape that's introduced, both Orlando White and Velma Hale ground the students first in this sacred space. And so which brings us to the sacred space of Tempe in Phoenix. As was mentioned before, we are on Ojo Den land, um, which is land that's foreign to me as well as foreign to uh, most of us here. Um, when I lived down in Chandler, I used to work here at ASU, I lived down here in Chandler. Um, and I used to work at Verizon Wireless that campus down there, um, and I didn't have a car, so I had to. There's a bus stop like like a half a mile away from the campus, so I would stop at the bus stop and walk towards the campus. And on that walk, there's this big empty lot. Amongst all this building, there's one empty lot that's like a dirt lot. So I would just walk through that to get to the campus. Um, and so, however, I began to have some health problems with my leg, so I went back home. Um, and I visited sort of like our traditional practitioners, uh, what people would call medicine man, right, uh, to get to see what was wrong, um, in addition to going to the hospital and everything like that. The hospital just said, you know, it might be uh, sort of like plantar fasciitis, stuff, stuff like that. They didn't really know what was wrong. Um, but in terms of the traditional practitioners, he said that there was a particular place in that area, in that dirt lot, um, that has. Um, some ruins, which is why no one's been able to develop on it because it's because there's ruins there and they don't want to disturb it. Um, which brings me back to this notion of sacred space. So it impacts us even though we don't really know it. Um, it impacted me, um, it may impact us, but in terms of the types of social justice movements that can occur in Arizona, right? So we have the freeway that's being built through South Mountain, we have Oak Flats to the east of us, and to the north there's uh, the Bears Ears National Monument right now that's under um, threat. And so these are the types of works I think that can happen when we bridge English language and reintroduce it through a physicality 
that's indigenous to this land particularly. Um, and so basically that's my presentation. But yeah, but we'll get to the questions after I think. All right, um, hi everyone. So I'm going to read a uh, work in progress. It's an essay um, that I titled sort of uh, quickly, I pledge allegiance to this flag, uh, Arivaka Writing with Humane Borders. But um, if this is ever going to see any sort of um, publication platform, I will change it. Okay, so I like that title. <laughs> uh, all right, um, so anyway. Uh, I have lived in Tucson for 18 months now. People from near and far tell me they love the images they see in my various social media feeds of this mysterious, moonscape-like desert surrounding Tucson. Many of my followers live along both coasts, so of course it gives me great pleasure to be able to ignite in awe for the uncontainable beauty of the Sonoran Desert, even if it is from afar. For me, being in this desert on any given morning or early evening means being given over to the expanse of possibility the landscapes offer. It has been the way to get new perspectives when stuck on a writing project, to step out into any number of trails and parks that surround Tucson and take it all in. Whether it's the way the light moves across the shallow valleys of Gates Pass before sunset, or the way the temperature surprisingly drops 10 degrees when your trail takes you into the shadowy parks that sit below Pima Canyon, the infinity of surprise that lives here is hard to deny. But as 110, 112, 115, 117 degrees becomes the new normal for Southern Arizona, indicating a climate change that may not be reversible in years to come, there is another, one, another thing one cannot deny. Any slight carelessness on your part and the desert will kill you. That fact made itself clear on a recent ride along outing with Guillermo and Steven, two volunteer truck drivers for the Southern Arizona organization, Humane Borders, Fronteras Compasivas. As soon as I climbed into the water replenishment truck, I was told that if we broke down in Arivaca an hour and 15 minutes south of Tucson, we would be exposed to the same conditions as the Latinx migrants who were trying to help. We would never be exposed to the same conditions as migrants making this trek. Any one of us engaging in volunteer work should have, this, should have that seared into our minds. I shook off any doubt that we would not be okay. We were the lucky ones, after all, traveling with over 100 gallons of water into the harshest topographies in the Southwest. At, at the worst, we would be sweaty and uncomfortable, changing the imaginary flat tire in my mind, wandering to worry, but we wouldn't die. Not right away, anyway. And that's why I made contact with the privilege they carried into different parts of the valley that blanketed the infamous border town, Arimaca. I wasn't sure I could ever make peace with it, though. If there was anything to do with the privilege, it was to risk it. And in this part of the country, the thing you did if you were somebody's anchor baby, a pedantic gantfly, a broke bourgeois bohemian who cared about justice and human rights and had heated conversations with family members during the holidays about immigration policy, the you who still wrote diversity statements for scholarship applications or ate nopal fries and drank aged whiskey cocktails with the liberal latte-sipping NPR listener in downtown Tucson where the adobe facades were restored to make it look like you were still in the old old Pueblo. You came and faced these incongruent truths, maxing out credit cards to do the thing you, you did in the name of justice, and it would never be enough. <clears throat> Humane Borders maintains a system of water stations in the Sonoran Desert on routes used by migrants making the perilous journey to the north, mostly by foot. Getting into the truck at Green Valley, we were promptly driven to the first water station situated behind a pecan orchard. The orchard looked momentarily out of place in time with its trees lined up tightly towering over a few acres covered by bright green grass, an indication of the obscene amounts of water it must have consumed on a daily basis for it to look that way. But I was thankful nonetheless for its place in the landscape and hoped it was there to offer some shady respite to the men, women, and children who made the orchard a part of their journey. As soon as we got to the water station, I may have quietly gasped at, a, at sight of concrete blocks at the side of concrete blocks, a quartet of two by four wood planks, and a 55 gallon plastic blue barrel sitting stoutly but bravely above the desiccated arroyo. These objects in any other home improvement configuration might not have inspired such deference, but it was like seeing Stonehenge in real life with all of the barrels implications for existing cohering in my mind. This severity, our national border policies producing the need for these rebel barrels, and suddenly I donned the beige mask of humanitarianism, some burnt pink on my brown skin. 
Or maybe I don't want this to be normalized. My privilege is showing, or at least it's caught in my throat. But my body is here to meet the risk, and that is what it is about, right? I will be the distraction so somebody less privileged can make their escape. I will make space in the back seat, I sit. Or I will use this platform so somebody can find the following words, quote, there is a problem on the border, end quote, and bring them into their privatized space within a place, a city even, uncertain to call itself sanctuary. Despite the gravity of the situation beginning to bring a sense of doom and mood to all of my other like-minded efforts, voting, calling my senators and representatives, tweeting my outrage, unleashing tiresome tirades to trolls whose world seem to get bigger while mine diminishes with activists and scholars dying early deaths. I imagined weary travelers emerging nearby. I felt myself dolefully assigned the landscape its benevolence, something to help muster the belief that what we were doing would make the slightest impact. It was Sunday. Of course we all had the same thought that morning. Would we encounter anyone in need of our help? Do migrants dream of blue barrels in the middle of the ocean of floor, hiding in the brush in the harsh moonscape dying under the weight of the sun? In the distance, I stopped and listened closely to what came before. A chorus of sighs of relief at the sight of a purple flag whose color had been made dull by the daily solar pounding it takes while waving intrepidly in the hot summer wind. After surveying the water station for cleanliness, potability, visibility, and instances of possible tampering, we moved on to the next water station des destination in Arivaca proper, Elephant Head. But before heading out of the pecan orchard, Stephen asked Guillermo who was driving, who was, Guillermo who was driving, to stop by a peripheral section of the orchard where he spotted empty water bottles and a spectrum of detritus of migrants past. Plastic bottles that were empty but still intact signaled recent passage. <clears throat> However, there were old discarded backpacks that, that like the life it carried inside, looked as dried out as any living creature that succumbs to the harsh co conditions of a merciless desert. It was those bit of human evidences that made the area seem anachronistic to travel by foot in a time saturated by every imaginable technology. This was our refugee crisis. I'm a passenger watching the scenery of the borderlands beyond the brink of madness. We are, all are. Every day could be marked by a colorful crucifix, at least a lot of us in the vehicle making this trip a mere tithe to the desert to spare the living crossing <coughs> through it. Over the course of the next nine hours, over nothing more than a stretch of six miles at three miles per hour, we were all mad or obsessed. It is this affective drag that impels, a vol impels volunteers like Guillermo and Steven to make this trip every two to three weeks for the last two years. No one should go through this. Everyone should run thumb and forefingers into the bullet holes of signs around the water barrels. Everyone should come close <coughs> to being trampled by the cattle roaming freely throughout Arivaca. Everyone should notice the wake of buzzards flying too close for comfort. When we arrived at Elephant Head, I noticed something that wasn't on the first blue container. La Virgen de Guadalupe, or a glossy sticker with her likeness, rather. All of my 12 years worth of nostalgic Catholic school hackles go up at the sight of the feminine deity that made her debut on a hill in Tepeyac, Mexico, an apparition that only an indigenous man under similarly violent conditions rechristened Juan Diego could witness. Stephen notices me noticing her and says it's hopefully a way migrants can understand that the water station is here to, there to help. I nod affirming that assumption and hoping non-Catholic migrants can decipher the tank as a sight of relief. But behind my sunglasses and smile, I bite my lip and pinch the muffin top peeking over my belt loop to keep me from crying. Time seemed to be marked by how close or far we were to, uh, to, curious mountain, to a curious mountain peak known as Babo Kibari, a sacred place for the Tohono O'odham nation as the home of the creator, Itoi, that resides in a cave, who resides in the cave at the base of the mountain peak. For the Tohono O'odham, Babo Kibari is a genesis of sorts. That we live on their stolen land is a wound we should never let heal. Throughout our ride along, Guillermo would stop for all of us to take in the scenery, snap photos, and stretch our legs. It felt like Babo Kibari was looking out for us as we did our best looking out for others. I touched my own ancestral amulet in my pocket, a piece of black kyanite with protecting energies. Our guys always get asked what happens if we encounter a migrant on these trips. Stephen says simply, a migrant is to be given food, first aid, and water. As the morning progressed and the sun's rays intensified, I felt the sweat pooling in and around my body's various concaves and then disappear. The desert was taking its rightful tithe from, of moisture from me. We snacked on sweet baby peppers and threw the ends out the window, to which Guillermo would say it would be a few hours, cops, before the desert consumed our biodegradable trash. We could all be untraceable. 
and it would be so easy here traversing Arigaka's deserts, ve desert veins and arteries. I started thinking about the ways in which the untraceable is made evident, or how the migrant's journey has been represented to me throughout my life as both reader and writer, as well as a 1980s child of Latinx immigrants from El Salvador and Mexico, and the one in the here and now, the adult child. In prose, we have writers like Ruben Martinez and Reina Grande rendering the experience of crossing over. Their portraits of others or selves, desperate to reunite with family in the north, all of whom in various pursuits of better economic stability. As a reader, as a reader, uh, these literary voices have meant finding the language to illustrate the ways these migratory traumas continue to haunt families, both constituted by and torn apart by humane border policies. When my parents' migration took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s, they were essentially crossing an imaginary wall with an Aryan agent policing those boundaries. Dare I say they came to the north in the innocent heyday of border crossing on par with the episodes of the Brady Bunch? or the golden age of border law breaking. And here in the paper is a link to um, that scene in Border East LA. I don't know if anybody knows the, that film, but it's Cheech Marin. And he's overlooking the green hill and down below, it's the um, border patrol truck and two guys that are just kind of like, oh, we, you know, we see the, 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 the wet, right? Uh, about to come, so let's just take a nap while by the time he comes down, we'll, we'll nap him. But as like they fall asleep, um, Cheech Marin, who the premise of the movie is basically he's a Chicano from East LA who is going to pick up his cousin at a factory in downtown that ends up getting raided and all the workers get deported and he gets mixed up in the, uh, in, in the, in the sweep. So he is a Chicano um, from East LA who speaks nothing but English and uh, has all of the um, makings of uh, you know, American, American pop culture. Uh, ends up in Tijuana trying to figure out how to get back. And as he's in Tijuana, his um, consciousness becomes sharpened by the border policies that he sees people um, that are just like his family members trying to like cross and make you know, a better life for themselves. So in the scene in which I linked to the YouTube, um, it's him uh, at the top of the hill, and then suddenly this whole like group of migrants um, come and uh, and then Neil Diamond's are coming to America, starts playing, and then they like just like um, launch down the hill. It's pretty amazing. And for all you meme makers, it's like uh, that picture. It, it's like perfect. Like for me, it's just like that feeling when you know your Chicano priv U.S. privilege has to be in service to those that don't have it, right? So you don't know what a meme is? Find a young person explaining. <laughs> So, or the golden age of border law breaking when detention centers meant nothing more than a bus ride to Ciudad Juarez or Tijuana while Los Tiras and North are saying earnestly about contraband and betrayal in a drug deal between lovers gone wrong. Oof, okay. But in the desert, the migrant's journey is represented to itself and to strangers like me who witnessed the representation, making the experience of being here that much more urgent. Oh man, just that on the level of the, se of the sentence, I'm sorry. <laughs> Take the work of artist uh, Alvaro Enciso's Monuments to Fallen Migrants, for, uh, for example. These colorful crosses affixed to, to the coordinates that mark where a migrant lost their life during the journey through Arivaca and other parts of southern Arizona. Seeing these crucifixes made unique in color and metal details and complementary colors in their intended habitat allows the spectator, whether another migrant, a border agent, or someone engaged in humanitarian aid, whatever the hell that means, a profound empathic encounter that enables a communing with the recently deceased while bringing to the minds for the realistic circumstance of future migrants dying in the desert nearby. It is these are kinds of artistic representations that operate as both homage and reminder that we need, to, we need each other to get by. We need each other to remember. We need each other to witness. Being out in Arivaca as we traveled at three miles per hour towards this water stations at Rocky Road, Cemetery Hill, Sogoranes, and the last station closest to the Mexican border at Martin as well, as the mesquite trees like night sky constellations took every shape possible in each of the landings we stopped in, I kept thinking of the work by Salvadoran poet Javier Zamora. Javier's poetry focuses on his own experiences as a child who bears witness in his poetry of what it means to endure passage in the desert and what it means to be one of the lucky ones. As we checked for the fl frayed flags and water levels at each stop, I thought about the young man named Chino remembered and made flesh again in Zamora's poem, Second Attempt Passing, <coughs> for Chino. This is Zamora's poem. In the middle of that desert that didn't look like sand and sand only, 
In the middle of those acacias, whipped tails and coyotes, someone yelled, La Migra, and everyone ran. In that dried creek where 40 of us slept, we turned to each other and you flew from my side in the dirt. Black-throated sparrows and dawn hitting the tops of mesquites beautifully against the herd of legs. You sprinted back towards me. I jumped on your shoulders and we ran from the white trucks. It was then the gun ready to press its index. I said, freeze, Chino, para, por favor. So I wouldn't touch their legs that kicked you. You pushed me under your chest and I've never thanked you, beautiful Chino. The only name I know to call you by. Farewell your tattooed chest, the M, the S, the 13. Farewell the number, the phone number you gave me when you went east to Virginia and I went west to San Francisco. You called twice a month. Then your cousin said the gang you ran from in San Salvador found you in Alexandria. Farewell your brown arms that shielded me then, that shield me now from La Migra. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm gonna read uh, about 14 uh, sonnets um, in a project I'm working on called uh, The Border Simulator. Um, and there's also uh, there's a, a not so hidden meme within those poems, um, kind of like transitioning from, from what Raquel was talking about, but uh, a sort of a quick introduction. Um, I was born in Alpine, Texas and raised in El Paso. My grandparents came to the border region in the 40s and 50s. I spent my whole life around a spectrum of border crossers, second generation, third, fourth, and people who just came over. I also lived in Washington, D.C. for a few years, and I was fortunate to befriend Salvadoreños, Hondureños, and other Central American friends who had recently crossed the Arizona desert looking for a better life. In my poetry, I explore how my family and friends crossed and how they assimilate or don't assimilate to a new culture. Just like in any border town, there are parts of El Paso that feel like Juarez, they feel like Mexico. All the signage is in Spanish and the culture feels more Mexican than American. I'm interested in exploring these spaces and complicating narratives, common narratives, stereotypes, both from the American side and from the Latino, Latinx side of what the border is and what it's like to cross and or live in the border region. Uh, so I hope that this device, the idea of a machine, that is a border simulator allows me to impart an experience of border life. Um, and what I'm about to read is called just the border simulator sonnets. Uh, the second poem I'm gonna read is not, is not a sonnet, but it's still uh, within the project. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is called When You're Lost in the Rain in Juarez and it's a simulation too. <laughs> the border simulator is stealing your children, okay? This technology is a bolt hole for those trying to cross. We'd rather you not cross, stay at the border, get fitted for a headset, see all the construction sites you want. We created a border where every day feels like dialing nine, then one, and then letting your finger hover over one. Nobody dies anymore, they just continue life in simulation. But you have to sew seat belts or paint murals there. You've always been a border simulator, resident, never real or simulated, and the crossers see that you're not real or simulated, and they're not sure if they are a mural of rural crossers. You simulate what a person with papers would say, would act like, so that you can cross over. Your accent is hard to understand. You have trouble saying your name, and you say it anyway. Customs are suspicious because you can't say your own name. So they take you in and make you paint murals of crossers at the border. The murals warn the crossers of what might be waiting for them, the unswerving field called future. All day, you're painting in the border simulator, portraits of crossers, and their portrait is just their face, covered by a phone. You paint murals of crossers going into the simulation, their faces also covered by their phones, but you can see their eyes, and they're scared of crossing. You ask them to pretend there is water, but they can only pretend there is water so long. After your service to the simulator, you're trying to figure out how to traverse your words, or the simulation traverses you. Dissimulation is not a question of fake or, or reality, but a performance of saying your name. If the simulation survives, you also survive, and you keep it alive by crossing. The simulation exists because you cross into it, and you love the threshold. When you speak of the border simulator, you're really speaking about how dollar signs can open up a whole new world of crossing. You go to the front of the line, 
Customs ask you less questions. In simulation, you can pay off the policia. It's harder to do that in reality. But it's not the result you want, and the simulation is a results-based game. When you speak of the border simulator, you're really speaking about X, where the two worlds meet, and there is an X on the border. Okay, now back into the sonics. In the border simulator, your ceiling is your floor. You realize the simulation, your simulation, depends on what side you're on concerning the crossers and who gets to pass the algorithm letting cross what was suggested. We can only pretend there is water here for so long. We synth what we think will be like after we cross. This is where they ask you about our mascots and our trips across the bridge. But you have always been this resident, the end of the bridge. You simulate what a person with papers would say, would act like, so that you can cross over. The skills you had to master to cross. You had to spend a lot of time locked in. You have family in reality too. Your family looks like your real family, and you treat them like you would if they were. They want for you to cross. Once you cross, they have a chance of holding on to your ankles and entering the unsimulated world. But you don't want to have two brothers or two sisters that almost look the same because you would confuse them. You might send one back who wasn't simulated. And now you're just waiting. You can see how unprepared some people start this journey. You start your journey with night vision goggles. A passing repair train lets you jump on, saving valuable hours. You're terrified of being seen by passing cars. The border is like your shampoo, conditioner, two in one. Take seconds before we run into the community on the other side. The wall in simulation has been up for years, and you haven't noticed any kind of change, except it's hard to see the other side through the mesh fence. If the patrol are doing their job right, then the agents and the jobs could go away. What's searching our lives, our horseback? The border simulator allows you to record any of these crossers from your screen and project the image of the crossers onto the wall. This document can help you be more like the crossers, yourself more like them. Just copy their gait. You can't project crossers onto the fence because the image goes right through the mesh. You can't project crossers onto the wall without the expressed written consent of the simulator. But the crossers didn't come here with consent. They came here as versions of themselves, gleaning updates in the discarded pile of voices. The voices were collected at the border. They are the voices of people who couldn't cross. Customs keeps their voice in piles, pooling in the back rooms, the only pool in this desert. At the apex of the bridge, you can pay dollar sign and glean through them the voices, can give you some shelter from customs for a time before they find out it's not your voice. We paint murals, but we like painting murals because it attaches us to a past, something people who look like us also did. As long as it's for personal use, we can take the culture of the crossers back into reality. But the dynamism of the crossers is the rural memories. Rural doesn't mean numb in the border simulator. And how did the crossers drive here? When you say they came here in trucks, were they driving the trucks? We were also trapped in the dash. They hit us, a cycle of wreaths around each other. We swallowed their sweat. You came to the border simulator for work. You thought jobs would save you <coughs> from boiling in cars, but the pain was just transferred. You're waiting for the video feed to begin again, because that's when you know it's time to transfer dollar sign to your account you share with your family in simulation. The money isn't real, but you can exchange, you can exchange dollar sign for more time in simulation. Can any of us survive the ground have you noticed any inconsistencies? Have you noticed any repetitions? Video feed in simulations beg. Inning again, you see your double on live video feed and want their inverted life. Something about the inversion makes it more clear that you were a non-crosser to pass without thinking about simulation, but it's printed on all your papers. When your double looks at those papers, they know you but only the bureau you. You knew how to choose a side, taking on the cloak of the crosser around the bridge and through the border. You're still a crosser, a container you're in. You're waiting for live video feeds to begin again. These, vir these virtual worlds cross their habits. 
onto the faces of those who let you through. Clothing grows heavy when character performance is discussed. Words begin to weigh you down as you continue to cross. Worlds begin to weigh you down. If you get lost, use power lines as guides. Even in simulation, you're a crosser. You cross to get here. Inserted into this text, you are read as a cam person, a camo crosser. What border you are on from moment to moment. The looping is what has kept you here against your will, yet you teamed through edges of border. The team wants to cross. Some will stay on the bench. Not all of us will be able to cross. Speak so that I may see the border. Words of habit like, these virtual worlds cross their habits onto the faces of those who let you through. Clothing grows heavier when character performance is discussed. Words begin to weigh you down as you continue to cross. Worlds begin to weigh you down. If you get lost, use power lines as guides. These generated responses will try and fool you, make you believe there is a border where there isn't one. With assurances of crossing, they have neither body nor biography. Ombre Aranya, pointing at Ombre Aranya. Do not resist arrest. Dialogues restricted scope. Better to be detained than be lost in the simulation. Refuse to make a declaration or sign documents. Blurring the distinction between crosser and the best formula is to not alter your routine at work or at home. Synchronize sound recording. If a fight breaks out in a bar, leave. For in the confusion, you could be arrested, even though you did nothing. The simulation needed lag. Border waits on the traffic webcams. Contact the port for lane manipulations. The bridge toll and when to avoid the border. Traffic crossing the border's weekend. Days off, you head to the border. We're in the middle of the desert where they said that he had crossed. You look for him, but you hope it's not him. You don't know where you are except the desert. You can't just leave the simulation behind. It follows you into your waking life. In the border simulator, the backpack smalls your shoulders. You've never been identified. You fought hard for a type of life that is no longer in vogue, but it's the vogue of where you're from. You're not popular and are decried as dirty and unwanted. The fence is easy to cross, but your thoughts aren't. All we have is a circular order of simulations. America's cultural parts calendar, the 8-bit desert. You're a U-shaped band to these people. Pattern grid and canals made human-linked deserts. Just hold another's hand and you're there. You collect wanderers and trade them in for water. You have bells on your cheeks, but you still escape patrol. The border doesn't return till much later. Evening simulation everywhere. Only the crosser warbling at the bridge. They're playing loteria with the banda. Border, the souvenir of the word that gets repeated over and over. Where did all the answers go to the border test? Will you or won't you decide to go back into simulation? Pictures are developed to instruct the crossers. They're waiting every day for you to play the flute and cover their breath holes. In, si in the simulation, we need jobs so the borders are lax. But once there's enough jobs, the guards at the emulator will let less and less come through. You can't remember where the bridge is located. Well, there's a free bridge and a pay bridge. The free bridge, you have to wait for hours and hours. You live here so you know. The algorithm used in the border simulator makes you understand yourself better, but not crossers. Why are you crossing? As a tourist, as a worker. Residents are temporary in the border simulator. They come looking for your accent, but you hide it in the sleeve of your jacket and take it out when you need it. Tourists and visitors are temporary. <coughs> you, Crosser, are the only constant. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's fantastic all around. I really appreciate that. Uh, we have uh, seven or eight minutes for questions. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor right now if people would like to ask something. That was so interesting. You must have questions. I don't have a question. I have this sort of connection. I mean, you started off. Um, Jay talking about echo poetics, indigenous poetics, and we have these poems of landscape of the borderlands. I'm just dying to hear somebody make a comment about how how uh, the pedagogy or the idea of indigenous echo poetics 
Maybe get lens on this creative work or how the creative work? Anybody help me out here? <laughs> answer the question you wish to ask. I mean, right now, right now, I think there's a lot of poets right now who are doing the work, um, particularly in the issues of migration and the border, um, particularly writers of color. Uh, I think a lot of them are doing work in terms of really the only work right that's calling on this idea mm -hmm. of landscape and ecology, environments and climate change through a poetic lens, a, a, a rather critical poetic lens, right, which is sort of breaking away from the normal conventions of what American poetry is or modern American poetry and sort of coming up with this whole new genre or whole new school of writers who are taking on that, that work of the borderlands and being able to really understand how landscape shapes language um, because it's a really intimate relationship. And that's what I want too, as well, is this, this language and this poetry that has an intense relationship as I have to landscape, um, that has an afterbirth that's buried in the land. Um, that's really what I'm calling for, and that's really what I'm interested in. And you know, works like Javier Samora are really interested in the idea of becoming part of the land and crossing this imaginary border, and I think it's really interesting and great to see. Yeah, I think also thinking about the ways in which um, the role of the pastoral, like in sort of mm -hmm. the Northeast kind of tradition, um, doesn't really, I think maybe there's a certain um, myopia to account for, uh, especially from this perspective in the Southwest, where um, holding the, the landscape accountable, right? That the landscape suddenly becomes implicated mm -hmm. in the way in which these policies are produced and executed. Um, or even in the way in which like history is um, uh, externalized, be, is uh, able to come into um, some sort of, you know, third eye light. Um, even taking, even cons uh, when you think about like, uh, I remember like going this road trip to Wyoming with uh, with my pro friend, and seeing Heart Mountain and being really struck by Heart Mountain, and then just being like, oh right, this is Heart Mountain. This is like the site of like uh, an internment camp. Mm -hmm. Right, and the fact that Heart Mountain had witnessed all of these like atrocities, right? That like the landscape, that nature is somehow always present and always there in ways in in, in ways in which we um, understand the way frontier was had become became become state, right? So, and I think um, trying to kind of get into those threads, um, you know, I think just even the, the the writers here were sort of shouldering the burden. Of our ancestral our ancestral histories and and even like more recent uh, uh, genealogies that those um, our, our 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 family members have been impacted by the way um, they've had to cut through you know the weeds the weeds the water yeah so. I think um, like the the landscape I'm concerned with is that that mental or psychic landscape of border towns, but specifically where I'm from in El Paso, because um, I, I grew up going to see my cousins in Juarez, and then going, coming back to El Paso and going to school in El Paso, and you know, switching between those two, those two worlds and those two mindsets. And I think that's where the idea of a simulation or a simulator allows me to, to kind of explore those, those worlds. Um, yeah. Did you put follow-up on Form, form landscape sonnet. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about why you grabbed onto the sonnet as a way to brush your way through. So uh, right now I'm working on this on a pro this project with uh, Andrew Monson, who's the head of the creative writing department at uh, at the University of Arizona, and he challenged me to to write to write sonnets. I I tend to write lyric poetry anyways. Like the lyric is is something I'm I really like, and that's what I gravitate to. And also, um, before this, my pro the, the poems were getting really long and kind of just out of, out of control. And he kind of just challenged me to, what if he just kept it to like 14 lines? I mean, that's really the only thing that's making me sonnets. Sometimes there's like 10 syllables, but mostly, <laughs> mostly it's just, yeah, right, right, yeah. Mostly it's just like, it's 14 lines, but. No rhymes. Yeah, yeah, no, 14 lines, not too many rhymes, but, uh, but yeah. Please. <laughs> I um, am so interested in this idea of eco-poetics, especially in terms of thinking about 
um, occupied named lands and how those lands are framed as empty and always already dead by folks who are trying to accumulate capital out there so that the landscape is literally rendered dead via its transmutation into capital, right? Capital will be harvested from resource extraction, or capital that's literally blown up when the weapons are tested out there that with the land with great. Um, so I'm wondering like what you see is the role of like an eco poet warrior in terms of getting this sort of idea out that the land is alive as well as the people who live upon it who are deeply impacted, you know, by this ongoing environmental genocide that is occurring in these areas where people are being desperately sick by these regimes of governance, you know. So like how do you get that poetry moving to actually challenge some of this stuff? Yeah, I think uh, thank you for the question. And in terms of uh, sort of like the role of the poet, I mean right now they're almost I think the last count, because me and one of my colleagues from IAI, uh, Manny Loli, we're working on sort of like a database of Diné poets um, who are working right now currently. And right now the list expands. I think it's 40 plus poets right now that we know of who are Diné, who are working in poetry specifically. Um, and in terms of eco-poetics, each one of them, even though they might not call themselves an eco-poet or a persona poet or anything of that nature, they're still, their work is still anchored in the landscape, particularly the Navajo Nation where they come from. Only because, again, we have some type of intense, um, unconscious, or conscious relationship to the land, whether we know it or not. Um, and so, right now, the work, I think, is, the, the goal, I think, is getting that put into the national conversation when we're talking about, like, right now with Bear's Ears, right? Um, I read an article about Bear's Ears, and then they talked about Shoun Bitsui's work in that particular article, right? So when we're talking about uh, rhetorical sovereignty or sovereignty of Native nations, particularly in sort of like a mental landscape, um, when those conversations are brought to the national spotlight, so are the Native and Diné and Indigenous thought processes accompanied with that, right? And so those are put on a pedestal, and those are questioned and complicated and criticized. And so therefore, we're beginning to have this sort of churning of thought based on indigenous thought. Um, and so that really, I think, is sort of the goal, is what I see particularly. Um, and so right now, I mean, I can definitely applaud all the Diné poets right now who are currently working, right? So we have Laura Tohi right here, who's a Navajo Nation Poet Laureate, um, working at ASU. There are tons of other poets right now here at ASU. Natalie Diaz is also not Diné, but she's a native poet. She's working on faculty here. Kyle Wilson, um, Simon J. Ortiz, Bojan Lewis, all faculty here at ASU who are native um, as well, working towards those types of goals on being put into the national conversation in regards to the landscape um, and the land and ecology. I think we're actually out of time, uh, but thank you all very much. Thank you three. Fantastic. Really.